Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Sam Hurst and this is the second in the series of A Gothic A Day Tempts the Vampires to Stay. Because, as we all know, a vampire can't resist a good gothic novel. And that did seem to be the option that people preferred. Much more interest in vampires staying than in keeping away. I'm afraid I missed yesterday because I was working, but don't worry, I will catch up, I promise. In this series, what I'm doing is taking a gothic text that I just kind of want to recommend to people or ask people to read, telling you about why it might be important, giving you a brief idea of the plot, and also adding a little suggestion at the end for some more reading in the same vein that you might like to do. So yesterday, two days ago, we talked about Horace Walpole's The Castle of Otranto from 1764 as the first Gothic novel. And often when we're talking about the history of the Gothic, there tends to be a little bit of a fix fixation on male writers sometimes. People like Bram Stoker, who wrote Dracula, Jekyll and Hyde, of course, was written by Robert Louis Stevenson. And people like Horace Walpole, Matthew Lewis, James Hogg, as the genre developed. But although Mary Shelley gets a lot of credit, she's far from being the only woman working in the Gothic. In fact, women have always been at the forefront of Gothic and also arguably horror production as well. And we see this in the case from today. This is the book. I only have one copy today. Shocking. We're going to be talking about Clara Reeves, The Old English Baron, a book that was really pivotal in the development of the Gothic in the 18th century. It was first published in 1778, although an earlier, less edited version had been circulated in 1777 as the champion of virtue. Now, Clara Reeves saw herself very clearly as channeling and interacting with what Walpole had done, but improving it and making it better. You could debate about whether that's what happened or not, but that's what she was trying to do. Basically, she said, I love your project. This idea of mixing the old romance and the new novel and realism, love it. Your execution, less so. Her main problem with it was this issue of the extreme supernaturalism that we talked about with the castle of Otranto. She wanted to bring the supernatural back within the realm of probability or possibility. And so in the Old English Baron, we have some magically opening castle doors, some ghosts that appear partly in dreams and some prophetic dreams. And that's about it. We're still in a magical world of sorts where there is an active providence and a sense of uh, the divine's action in the world. But there's no giant limbs, there's no skeletons walking around, there's nobody stepping out of a painting in this one. And we can really see the way that Clara Reeve influenced the development of the genre as it went into the 1790s with writers like Anne Radcliffe, keeping the supernatural within the realms of a possibility and often in the end stepping away from a supernatural explanation. So what's the Old English Baron about? Well, quite a lot of the plot might be familiar to you from the Castle of Otranto. Like the Castle of Otranto, we have a, a hero, Edmund, who appears to be a servant or a serf, but isn't at all, really. Spoiler alert, he's the noble son of a noble house. The story opens with Sir Philip Hartley returning from war, and he's off to meet his friend Arthur Lovell. But when he... Uh, goes to sleep that night, he has a dream which doesn't seem to bode very well. When he arrives at Arthur Lovell's castle, he finds that his friend is dead. The castle was inherited by his cousin Walter Lovell, who then gave it to his cousin or sold it to his cousin, uh, the Baron Fitz Owen. Um, he gets on quite well with the Baron Fitz Owen and that's where he meets Edmund, who because of his innate nobility had been partly adopted by the family but has had some run-ins with some of the young people. So he ends up being outs with them. He also ends up discovering via the medium of ghosts the truth about what happened to his parents, which is a tale of dastardly murder and usurpation. And so we kind of get to the end of that whole plot by the mid-mark of the novel, 
And that's where we go into the second half, which is all about the legalities of claims of usurpation and retaining property. So it's how does he prove he is who he is and how does he negotiate getting his inheritance back? And how does that affect the people that live in the castle now? Something that's quite interesting is you might expect Edmund to be off and about fighting for his inheritance, but that's not really what happens. It's Sir, Phil Sir Philip Hartley who ends up fighting the evil Sir Walter Lovell in order to get this property. It's also worth noting that there aren't any real deaths at the end, so Walter Lovell gets the chance to redeem himself. Bob's off into the distance. What is really interesting about the novel is seeing it as that midway point between that sort of medieval uh, version of the Gothic that we see in Walpole, moving into the development of the Gothic that we find in Radcliffe, that sort of uh, motif of persecuted virtue and a much more toned down interaction with the supernatural. If you enjoy Clara Reeve, I would recommend reading her Progress of Romance, which is an overview of this issue of what's going on in the literary field in the 18th century. It's fascinating. I'd also recommend reading the essay by Anna Letitia Barbold and her brother John Aitken um, about the pleasures of terror and also their fragment Sir Bertrand, because that also gives you an idea of this midpoint, this uh, journey in the development of the Gothic between 1764 and its heyday in the 1790s. So thank you for joining me. I'll see you tomorrow. And again, I ran slightly over. Sorry. Bye.